afternoon. And it is afternoon for our uh, Lunch and Learn in October of 2013. I'm very happy that all of you could make it today. We have lunch catered by Cronies. Let's give a hand for Cronies today. There is a Goodwill offering on the, on the table with the food, and if you feel so inclined, we would appreciate your donations to help recover that cost. Um, the author's books are for sale and will be here after the program. Uh, our Lunch and Learn next month, November 10th, is Are You Eating Smart Wapaka? And the Green Fountain Inn is catering that lunch. So I hope you'll join us. Please make reservations at least a day in advance. Our beer bu brewing exhibit is on and, and bubbling in the other room, so you may want to go in and check it out. It is really fabulous to look at. And they're having a program on the 28th of October, Thursday night, the 28th, and they're going to have some demonstrations and some samples, so you may want to put that on your calendar. Remember to check out or get your library card today if you don't have a card with us. And thank you for entering through the library proper and coming down so that we get you counted as a visitor. Without any further hesitation, I will introduce our speaker. Mary Burgeon is from Madison and is a worldwide traveler, but really loves to travel within the Midwest. And she's written some books on that subject. I'm going to let her tell you all about this. Mary Burgeon. I, um, let's see, I just want to get off to a start where everybody can hear, so. First, thank you for having me here. It was a delightful drive from Madison today. The weather, beautiful, the colors starting to change. It's a great time of the year, and I know that you all know that probably as, as much as anybody in Wisconsin because of your lovely chain of lakes. I was last here in summer for a vacation, uh, rented a place for a long weekend, and, and just, just loved what you have here. It's, it's a gem, and I hope you realize that, because I've noticed that there are two kinds of people in the world, those who um, uh, know what they have and relish it every day, and those who take it for granted and, and don't really realize, uh, uh, unless maybe it's gone. So. Uh, thanks for having me here. Great to be in Wapaka. Um, a little bit of background about myself first. I'm a longtime newspaper person. I worked at the Capital Times in Madison for 20 years, and and uh, you know that was my most recent newspaper job, working as a features editor and also a writer at that publication. I started uh, uh, my work though in the 1970s at the Oshkosh Northwestern. I'm not sure if Wapaka is still in the readership area. Is that your daily newspaper here? It's not. Post Crescent? Yeah, yeah. OK. Um, I love the Post Crescent, especially recently, because uh, since 2002, I've written a weekly newspaper column that I've syndicated. And some newspapers are easier to get on board than others. And the Post Crescent just picked it up. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad about that. Uh, what else can I tell you? I uh, uh, worked at the Capital Times until I took a newspaper buyout in 2008. Uh, it was offered to us because, like a lot of newspapers, declining circulation <laughs> meant that um, uh, things needed to move in a different way, downsizing and what have you. I had already downsized myself to a part-time writer at that point, so I thought, why wouldn't I just keep going? And so I have. And it's been a real lean way to make a living, but uh, I wouldn't trade the freedom and the opportunities for anything. I've, uh, uh, as Peg mentioned, I've written some books. My, my freelancing goes in all kinds of directions, and, and uh, that includes books that I've written. Um, the first one came out in uh, 2006, Sidetrack for Wisconsin, or in Wisconsin, and uh, then Hungry for Wisconsin, a book about uh, lesser known uh, gems that concern food uh, came out in 2008. The, uh, the book I'm talking about today, Sidetracked in the Midwest, A Green Guide for Travelers, uh, uh, came out after that. And, and actually, I had a, a new book just a, as of earlier this year called Eat Smart in Germany. See, little by little, we're moving. We start with Wisconsin, Midwest, Germany. I'm trying to do it in a logical way. 
Uh, that's a culinary travel guide for people who want to eat authentically when they visit Germany or when they, um, if they don't go to Germany, if you want to cook authentically, there are some recipes from, from people who are, are uh, good chefs in Germany and then a few other people who um, uh, are closer to home have contributed things for that too. So anyway, um, I tend to prepare remarks because I'm not, um, I tend to be more of a scatterbrain. So please bear with me as I read and, and, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, uh, cover this topic today as, as well as I can. Since 2008, since I left, uh, when I left the Cap Times after 20 years of work as a features editor and writer, much of my life and work have been incredibly odd and unpredictable. One of the biggest things I've learned about myself since becoming a travel writer 11 years ago is that I really don't want to be away from home all that much, especially since home is Madison and Wisconsin. As a kid growing up on a small farm in Sheboygan County, I would have never dreamed of traveling to Egypt, Israel, South Africa, New Zealand, or Thailand, as I've had the opportunity to do during, during the last six years. My childhood was one of Sunday drives, not vacations. And those outings happened in spring, after crops were planted, and autumn, after the last of the corn was picked. Back then, it was enough to see the geese black in the fields at Horicon Marsh, less than two hours from our farm. We'd loop around the communities of Waupon, Horicon, and Mayville and make a full day out of it. I was almost a teenager before I first stepped uh, foot out of state, and that was for a 4-H club trip to Chicago. I was a college student before taking my first airplane ride to California, where my grandmother made me root beer floats after lunch and then Brandy Manhattans after dinner. <laughs> she was trying quite successfully to make up for our inability to visit more frequently. <laughs> anyway, my love and appreciation of travel, in part, sprouted from my lack of direct exposure to what the world had to offer, and my curiosity about what life was like far from home. When we talk about green travel these days, it's not just about a walk in the park. International Ecotourism Society says preserving and respecting culture and long-standing traditions also count. That means we support local econ economies by celebrating our differences and uniqueness, by patronizing mom and pop restaurants and inns, and by buying souvenirs that are made where we travel, not the cheaper knockoffs that are imports. Much of this is possible. <laughs> Whoops, wrong one. Good. Next, we'll just go like that. Much of this is possible in Riviera Maya's Playa del Carmen, which I revisited a couple of years ago. But more and more high end destination resorts in business and under development offer the traveler so much that there is less of a reason to seek the authentic on simpler terms. Destination resorts, you come, you're gated in, everything is there, there's no reason to leave. Big business there and elsewhere is also good for, is good for the, but big business there and elsewhere also is good for the economy because it provides many jobs. Uh, we also know it has the potential to destroy the reason for people to travel. I'm talking about business developments that congest, the muscle of internationally known lodging and restaurant brands, the temptation to stay connected to what you know via the internet and TV channels instead of tuning it out to experience something new. The Mayans are poor, uh, or rather the Mayans are not poor, just different, a tour guide told me uh, there back in uh, 2006. They are self-sufficient and happier than many of us. They don't know the word stress or the word PlayStation. <laughs> I had asked about that after seeing a waiter make a sign of the cross while slipping a $1 tip into his pocket. 
When we think about ecotourism, we tend to think about uh, seeing and walking lightly in jungles, rainforest, deserts, ice caps. Here's an extreme example, eco-camping in the national park of uh, Chile's Patagonia. The eco-camp accommodations are far from rustic, and that was a surprise to me. When thinking eco-camp in Patagonia, you aren't likely to envision meals of slow-roasted lamb or salmon with capers served on white, and uh, meals served on white linens matched with goblets of fine wine. A pot-bellied stove nicely toasts the interior of a domed tent that is 30 feet in diameter and 13 and a half feet tall. It's used for meals and socializing. Within a cushion of synthetic insulation is a large window of heavy plastic that reveals the park's signature peaks. We slept on mattresses, not the ground, with thick blankets and a cushion of synthetic insulation in our dome tents, each one big enough for two. EcoCamp Patagonia is inside a 450,000 acre national park, which since 1978 has been a UNES UNESCO World Biosphere, Biosphere Reserve. It's lush with waterfalls, glaciers, lakes, and mountainous, mountainous terrain. Some people say it's one of the purest places on Earth. But the guides who I, I met were torn between wanting to share what they love and knowing that a proliferation of tourists could destroy that paradise. When I visited in 2006, EcoCamp capacity was 30 travelers. Now it's 56 because of the addition of suite, domes, and those have private bathrooms. During my three-day stay, it was rare to encounter other people and vehicles. I saw more herds of wild guanaco and strutting rias than tourists or gauchos on horseback. They were tending flocks of sheep. So that's one example of ecotourism, but I think earth-friendly travel doesn't have to be limited to exotic locations like this or beautiful natural space, spaces. Um, I'll offer up a simple example of the beauty we have in Wisconsin, especially at this time of year. The more I get to know our state and the surrounding Midwest, the more I appreciate the nuances of nature, plus the ingenuity and thoughtfulness that some Midwesterners bring to the table with regard to tourism. It is perfectly logical for us to, to lead eco-travel efforts, it's, uh, especially in our home state of Wisconsin, a place where our forebearers included Aldo Leopold, John Muir, Gaylord Nelson. We are also home to uh, Travel Green Wisconsin, the nation's first statewide effort to set standards and ratings for conservation in tourism. I just got a press release that states more than uh, 365 businesses are now on that uh, Travel Green Wisconsin certification list. The newcomers include a few parks and bike trails, plus Door County bike tours, the Paper Discovery Center in the Fox Valley, and the Concapot Lodge in Bowler, which is in Shawano County. I don't know anything about that place, but whenever something new is listed, it makes me want to find out more. <coughs> uh, I've mentioned the, uh, the, the books that I've written, and I, I tend to be not um, about lyrical prose, but more of a journalistic approach. Uh, letting you know um, uh, what I see, what people have to say, and I seek out things that are, um, that go under the radar, uh, uh, try to go beyond the obvious and explain the backstory of an of a unusual destination. So in Sidetrack for Wisconsin, for example, you'd read more about the Bernard Schwartz House and Two Rivers than you would about Taliesin. Both are Frank Lloyd Wright designs, but the Schwartz House sits in an average neighborhood in Two Rivers, and it can be rented for overnight stays. It has an interesting history, too. Life magazine in 1938 
<coughs> commissioned Frank Lloyd Wright to create a dream house for a typical family that earned $5,000 to $6,000 a year. That would be about $60,000 in today's dollars. And this is what he came up with. I, I really like Frank Lloyd Wright's work, but I try to not duplicate travel ideas from one book to another. So um, that presented a bit, a bit of a dilemma later on, like with the green travel book, because um, he, he was all about green travel with his organic architecture principles, bringing, uh, merging the outside and the inside together. Um, but you know, how, how can you not include something about that in, in like a like sidetrack for the Midwest? So uh, Monona, Mon, Mon, it's Monona Terrace that makes the cover of the book. It's in Madison, and uh, it, it makes it because of the progressive design Built, uh, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright, the first con convention center to gain silver leadership in energy and environmental design certification. People more commonly refer to that as LEED certification. Uh, comes from the U.S. Green Building Council, which has a rigid set of things you must do to <coughs> be certified and then uh, receive these different levels of certification. Uh, the building was designed by Wright in 1938, but it wasn't completed until 1997. Lead ratings make a difference when I, uh, was, uh, when I was trying to decide what to include in this book about green travel, because there's a lot of paperwork and expense that go into the documentation of all the sustainable measures that you undertake <coughs> to, um, to try to gain that status. But those ratings aren't everything, especially for people of goodwill and deep intention who didn't have a budget for such things. So I, uh, when I did my book research, I also took a look at other types of notable and unusual efforts that emphasize sustainability and of our interest to the average traveler. Much of what I came up with is based upon my own judgment and thousands of miles of research to find examples of the best efforts that seem authentic and not just part of bandwagon. I write about places throughout Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois, and then I pay attention to St. Louis, Kansas City, Indianapolis, and Nebraska City in this book. <coughs> My research focused on four areas, food and drink, lodging and retreats, nature and wildlife, and the old and the new. So besides Monona Terrace, um, I included a couple of other right projects of, of significance, including the gold level lead building expansion at First Unitarian Society in Madison. This is my church too. Um, and the congregation was really um, struggling to figure out how to, you know, the, the original First Unitarian meeting house is a, is a national landmark because of the discussion that led to this addition. There's a certain contingent in the congregation that really was afraid that in the process, and we needed the extra space because the congregation was growing. Some people really didn't want anybody to mess with the meeting house, and so they uh, took the steps necessary to make it uh, a national landmark. And then, um, you know, this addition uh, made with sustainable materials, a lot of natural light, and also, um, you know, kind of, it, 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 goes, it goes with the meeting house, just like looks good together. I also include the Historic Park Inn, a right design hotel in Mason City, Iowa, city with a population of 27,000 people. The hotel opened in just 2011, after decades of, um, uh, being uh, musty and in disrepair. Um, it was, the building was Frank Lloyd Wright's prototype for the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, which no longer stands. Wright only designed six hotels in his lifetime. His three-story Imperial Hotel survived Japanese earthquakes and World War II, <coughs> but not the fever to build bigger and better. The building was de demolished in 1968, about 50 years after it opened. 
to make room for another high rise in the city of 12 million. But in Mason City, it was an $18 million renovation <coughs> guided by Right on the Park, a local nonprofit group that kept the areas uh, and the building historically accurate uh, while it also enlarged the number of accommodations to meet the expectations of modern travelers. That means 27 rooms, all with private baths, instead of the original 61. Furnishings mimic the sleek and simple geometric patterns that de define Frank Lloyd Wright's work. But you also had flat screen TVs, coffee ma makers, touchpad, temperature lighting controls added, and original artwork. A long line of art glass windows in guest rooms and a long ago ladies par parlor overlook Mason City Central Park downtown. More art glass lights up the ceiling of the, sky, of the skylight room, a reception area that's behind the lobby. This Mason City building, known first as City National Bank and Hotel, was on its way to becoming no more than a historical footnote because of bankruptcy, foreclosure, decades of disrepair, vacancy, and neglect. The exterior is a sturdy example of Wright's prairie school design, which means thick overhangs and flat roofing. Much of what locals learned about restoration came from old photos, memorabilia, and volunteer work to peel back layers of paint, paper, and wood. People keep donating their time and memories, said the hotel's general manager. I feel privileged to work here. Everyone who comes in seems to have a story about the hotel's past. This building is a treasure and we appreciate it. We have people coming here now from all over the world. I mentioned my four research areas for the book, food and drink, lodging and retreats, nature and wildlife, and the old and the new. That latter category includes old buildings that have been revamped, especially those that take on a new or unusual purpose. Here's um, uh, the village at Grand Traverse Commons in Traverse City, Michigan. It's a former, as they said in the day, insane asylum, which turned into an attractive site for dining, shopping, hiking, lodging, all kinds of events. It, uh, the 1885 structure is, a, is one quarter mile long, and it used to house 3,500 mental health patients on 1,100 acres. Now, bit by bit, it's being transformed into a residential, retail, and public gathering spot, the largest for the city. You can't get any greener than rehabbing an old building, the developer told me. He was a Detroit native who moved to Traverse City in the 1990s, or 1980s. And he says, Detroit used to be a beautiful city. I saw a remarkable number of buildings. <laughs> they are destroyed through neglect. Europe treasure, treasures its antiquities, but we sure don't. <coughs> On this complex is a former uh, fire station that has turned into a bakery, a building used for potato peeling, <coughs> is a restaurant, a winery that sells uh, by the glass or growler, and a coffee roaster occupy the former laundry facility. On the ground level of the main building is an assortment of independently owned boutiques, bistros, offices below, three floors of condos above, many with waterfront views of Grand Traverse Bay. Another 400 acres is Traverse City's biggest parcel of community gardens and preserved parkland, with trails for hiking, bicycling, and snowshoeing. The front lawn is turned into the site for farmer's markets, concerts, festivals. It really has um, become a, a hub that they didn't have before. Here's another example of old to new, City Museum in St. Louis. Anybody been there by chance? They need, it's made out of junk. <laughs> and and uh, they need to have a different name for it because City Museum sounds kind
kind of boring and, and straightforward. What it is, is a, it's like the city's ultimate recycling project. It has elements of entertainment, suspense, adventure, danger. So imagine a school bus that looks like it might tumble from the top of a 10-story building. You can see it a little bit up there um, in the bigger picture at the top center. And it's not far from a rooftop Ferris wheel. You can take a seat on either, and nearby an, an abandoned jet, which you see, hovers and seems suspended in air. The St. Louis City Museum, a former shoe factory and warehouse, opened in 1997, full of secret passages and artwork made from cast-off materials, thanks to the imagination of a local sculptor. The nimble climb, tunnel, climb tunnels, swing on ropes, fumble through darkened caves, step up to a tree house, slide down rollers that used to transport shoes through the factory assembly line. <laughs> Kids love it, you can imagine. Some paths are five stories high. Climbing happens in and out of the building. And although conspicuous signage alerts parents to potential hazards while at play, and the names of lawyers who have sued the museum because of injuries, information seems to entice people more than, than hold them back. Bloggers pr play, praise the place while boasting about the brumps, bumps and bruises they burn there. The work to create new exhibits and climbing channels is ongoing, so City Museum doesn't seem stale to repeat visitors. Picture dragonflies, giant dragonflies made out of old watch bands, a ceiling fringe made of hundreds of old neckties, mosaics of junk, junkyard scraps, um, which uh, uh, my guide that day referred to as foreign object debris. <laughs> Daredevils enroll in circus skill classes, learning trapeze to wire walking at City Museum. Creative spirits emerge with unique souvenirs made spontaneously in a glittery, glittery and cluttered art city workshop. <coughs> a nonprofit project for public spaces based in New York includes City Museum on its list of great public spaces in the world, describing it as an adventurous ramshackle collection of outsized sculptures and play spaces, <coughs> including famous multi-story slides. Couples on dates, maybe parents who want to calm their nerves have a drink at Beatneck Bob's, <laughs> whose carnival, carnival theme includes corn dogs through the ages at, on exhibit, uh, or they get a drink at the Cabin Inn, an 1804 log cabin on the City Museum's sec, uh, ground floor. Um, <coughs> the only real somber place in the museum is the third floor where you see an unusual assortment of architectural artifacts accompanied by the often sad tales of demolition undertaken in the name of progress. Bargain hunters go up to the bailout on the fourth <coughs> floor, a clothing resale shop that's touted to be among the biggest in the Midwest. Inventory arrives in one-ton bales. Prices are paltry, $1 for a coat, $2 for a tuxedo. <laughs> What else? Okay, under nature and wildlife, I include the National Eagle, Eagle Center, uh, very close to the Mississippi, the International Wolf Center, uh, Ely is up uh, uh, north of Dubuque. It's a beautiful drive along Lakes, uh, Lake Superior, and the North American Bear Center, all in Minnesota, of course. Under food and drink, I pay attention to national festivals for blueberries, cherries, strawberries, asparagus, and morel mushrooms, all in Michigan. Michigan likes to claim that label uh, of, of national, whether they have the lead in production or not, I've noticed, because I was checking. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, and I say the state isn't the production leader in all these categories, but the enthusiasm is sure genuine for all of these festivals. 
the more eclectic the combinations, the better, from my perspective, for this book, for my writing in general. So accommodations for this particular book project ranged from the luxury Dana Hotel in Chicago to the off-the-grid Fern Hollow Cabin near Decorah, Iowa. An overnight stay at Fern Hollow was one of my finest memories during um, the time I spent putting this book together. And this is a part of how I explain it. <coughs> Fresh flowers show up in a half dozen containers. Ginger snaps cover a fancy ceramic plate. A jar of mint-flavored water chills in the refrigerator. I read Mary Oliver's poetry and thumb through a book of blessings. I write, doze, and almost grab a flashlight to sneak a midnight snack from the berry patch just a few steps from my door. Only an owl's occasional hoot interrupts the low but electrifying hum of crickets as darkness comes. What I can't do is turn on a TV, hop on the internet, or use a cell phone. Playing a radio is possible, but it would feel like screaming in church. It's so quiet that the flight of a single hummingbird in daylight sounds like a lawnmower run amok. Booking a stay at the three room, as in kitchen, bedroom, sitting room, Fern, Fern Hollow Cabin, built in 1853, is one way to live off the grid in no northeast Iowa. Bird chirps are my alarm clock. Ceiling fans do a pretty good job of moving human air. Breakfast arrives with a quick knock and soft singing. In the basket, left outside the door, is a note. <coughs> this morning, pecan currant muffins. Yogurt milked and made yesterday. Maple syrup from trees you can see out your window. Raspberries picked this morning. Apple raspberry juice we made last year. Melon from the farmer's market. The meal appears in a pleasant mismatch of antique and ordinary bottles, jars, and linens. <coughs> I eat at a heavy butcher block table, covered with a tablecloth of cross-stitching, the kind that fewer and fewer grandma's treasure. Scavenged handicrafts turn the secluded old house into a home. It's about needlepoint and crochet, quilts and wood carvings. Add pottery and fine china, a fat hand-me-down library of books and games, walking trails cut into a forest. A wooden swing for two overlooks a wide garden and wildflowers. Built in 1853, revived in 1989. That's how the owners described the log cabin they lived in for 15 years before renting it to travelers. The wife's great, great, great grandparents raised six children in two rooms. The present owners dismantled the structure, moved it 12 miles, and reassembled it on a brick foundation to add a third room. Two daughters were born and raised in the cabin before the family built a larger house with reclaimed materials just a few yards away. Liz, the, uh, the wife of the couple, says the land and its people near Decorah speak to the deepest part of my soul. She was born in 1961, raised in a Twin Cities suburb, and freelances as a musician. She also managed the local um, food co-op for 25 years. Her husband owns a taxi service. Their life choices follow a Great Depression <laughs> mantra. Use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. That means buying used clothing, writing on both sides of the paper, foraging for wild food, and growing their own, plus turning recycled wood pulp into house insulation. Wealth is not a priority because a couple spots riches outside of their windows, songbirds, <coughs> sunsets, ripe tomatoes, just pick corn. Solar panels provide all electricity. There is no well for water. Whatever is used is purchased or collected rainwater. A 
Fern Hollow stay might realign your notion of what it means to be a serious steward of the land. It might reinforce your desire to conserve energy or inspire life changes. Kitchen appliances are modern, but many mundane tasks of daily living require extra steps and thought. That includes a compost toilet outdoors, or um, using a chamber pot in the bedroom. Uh, only cold water runs on a, from the kitchen tap, so you boil what you need for cooking and cleaning. To bathe, you pour the heated water into a bucket that's next to a shower stall, then you turn on a switch so that the water can move and spurt from a shower nozzle. You think twice about all of this because of the extra time, the extra effort, and the questionable necessity of each self-indulgence. Also, uh, in that area of Decorah is the Pepperfield Project, a nonprofit effort uh, devoted to rural life skills, including cooking, food preservation, and gardening, and seed savers exchange. I, I bet somebody here knows of seed savers. If you're with gardening, uh, you, you, you know what that's <laughs> about. A mecca for people who are seriously curious about food beyond what we see in the grocery store. Inside the 890-acre Seed Savers Exchange Heritage Farm are many demonstration and display gardens that preserve the integrity of thousands of rare flowers, vegetables, fruits, and herbs. About 25,000 types of seeds make up the nonprofit Seed Savers collection. The work began in 1975 with the seeds from two plants, the German pink tomato and Grandpa Ott's morning glory, brought to the U.S. from Bavaria in the 1870s. Diane Ott Wheely, a seed savers co-founder, received the seeds from her terminally ill grandfather, and she wanted to make sure that this part of him, he loved gardening, and that it would not be lost. Now, today, members of her international organization support the genetic preservation work um, of, of all this type of thing on the farm's uh, certified organic property. About 700 of the 1,300 members of Seed Savers agree to exchange family heirloom seeds with other members. Okay, what else qualifies as green travel? In Ann Arbor, Michigan, is the Zingerman's Food Empire. Anybody know of Zingerman's? Yeah. Um, and it includes a, I call it like a rabid, go local agenda. They have cheese making classes, products at farmers markets, comfort foods based on seasonal ingredients that grow on local farms. Alex Young, executive chef of Zingerman's Roadhouse, won a James Beard Award recently. He has his own farm, too, and, he, and uh, the meats and produce from it are what help supply uh, uh, his restaurant. In Milwaukee, we have Dave Swanson, who's um, Braze on the Go cooking school, travels to where the food is, sometimes uh, using a farm and its harvest as a class setting. Um, for me, when I ran into him, he was uh, setting up a class on the outskirts of the Kettle Moraine State Forest near West Bend uh, and doing something on morel, hunting and what to do with morels <laughs> and cooking. Now, uh, and since uh, that class, he's also opened a, a dinner-only restaurant in Milwaukee called Bray's. Um, called Braze because he says that's one of the first cooking terms a, a, a chef in training learns. And, and he thought that um, basics were a good thing to emphasize in the restaurant. He is a strong advocate of restaurant-supported agriculture. Uh, a lot of you have probably heard of community-supported agriculture shares where you buy uh, into a, a share of a farm for a year, and if the farm does well, with its harvest, you do well, and if the farm doesn't do as well, you're just sharing in a part of the risk. Uh, Dave thinks that restaurants should do this too. 
Um, and, and he has a community supported restaurant concept at Braves, so, uh, you know, not, not as much risk there, but he, he's asking, it's almost like a paying a membership or dues every year. If you become a, a, a supporter of his Braves restaurant, then you get discounts and, and what have you throughout the year. Let's see, I also like the Stone Barn uh, near Nelson. Uh, fairly close to the Mississippi River, <clears throat> really out in the country though, and I think I think it's closed for the season. Um, it's um, you know people drive for miles to get pizza at this place, and it's the ruins of an old stone barn. The pizza's made in a 700 degree oven uh, with farm raised ingredients. There's no other reason to come here except for the pizza, but <laughs> many people come because it's such a pretty drive. And then once you get there, the grounds are, are lovely, and the pizza is good, and people linger. Uh, they eat outside. I guess they, uh, since I've written about them, they uh, have added um, sheltered type of seating too. The owner, Pam Taylor, used to be a computer systems analyst in the Twin <coughs> Cities. She did that for 21 years before she decided this is what she wanted to do. And, and that is partly because her dad was dying and she was taking time off of work and reassessing her own life. In Waterloo, near <laughs> Madison, Trek Bicycle Corporation, in the news now because uh, it, uh, it's... Um, uh, former executive is um, going to be running for governor. But I put this in here because bicycles are earth-friendly travel. These are made close to home. They're notable because, you know, even though we don't like Lance Armstrong anymore, he uh, did make a name for this company because of uh, the use of their bikes and uh, uh, by him in the Tour de France. Um, and the company is our country's biggest bicycle manufacturer, which I guess I didn't realize until I started looking into it. The bike frames and wheels are made in Waterloo, that's Jefferson County. Drive trains and the final products come together um, uh, about 45 minutes south in, in Whitewater, which is Walworth County. Uh, Trek as a company has been around since 1976. The technology, carbon technology, produces bikes that are real lightweight but strong and um, exceeding aerospace standards for manufacturing. Prices range from $300 to $10,000. And at the low end are, are bikes for kids. But you can go here. You can go here for free one, free one hour tours uh, at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays when I last checked. You walk through the bicycle collections that the company has. You see the creative department's design studio, um, the race team shop, where every bike used by Trek athletes is built and inspected. You hear about other things that you can't, <coughs> can't go on, like a, a ruddy, um, ruddy acreage near the uh, factory where the bikes are tested and abused uh, to some point to see if they stand up. I'm looking at the, eh, we still have a little bit more time. Um, what I have at the end here, because I never know how fast I'm gonna talk, <laughs> is um, questions, little questions. So I'm gonna ask a question. If anyone cares to answer, that's fine. And if not, I'll just, um, a little play little teasers. At Kendall College in, in Chicago, why would you eat a student's final exam? Because it's a cooking school. <laughs> Eating someone else's homework can be a pleasure when it happens at the college's culinary arts program, which has about 700 enrollees. Fine dining at subsidized prices gives tomorrow's chefs real life experience. 
And um, in addition to that, there's a, a, a neat exhibit, exhibit of antique cooking e equipment. Some artifacts are 500 years old. So the next time you go to the Chicago area, if you go by car, as opposed to, like me, um, park at like Harvard, Illinois, where I can park for a dollar and a half a day and, and then catch a train and take a two-hour ride right to downtown Chicago. But if you choose to drive, and then you can get to Kendall College on the L and with a couple of buses and stuff like that. Um, some people don't like doing that. So if you drive, uh, time it to um, indulge in what these kids prepare. Some of it's real fancy food, others down home cooking. Uh, they uh, also put a big emphasis on using locally grown ingredients, that type of thing. Okay, UNESCO doesn't designates World Heritage Cultural Sites, like Stonehenge in England, Machu Picchu in Peru. Where is there one in Illinois? I try to make these as obscure as possible. Cahokia Mounds. It's near St. Louis. It's a Native American culture, the largest pre-Columbian settlement north of Mexico. Uh, where people lived between 700 and, 12, or 700 and 1400 A.D. 2,200 acres, and it's been a uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site since 1982. As a community, Cahokia was larger than London in the year 1250, and its population peaked at around 20,000. There apparently was no larger city in the United States until 1800, when Philadelphia's population surpassed it. Isn't that odd? I think that's odd. Had this agricultural community used building materials that would have withstood prolonged exposure, like the limestone at Mexico's Chichen Itza or the granite of Peru's Machu Picchu, Cahokia mounds would arguably be just as well known, but instead they were using wood and as it is only wall trenches and post holes remain as evidence of the <coughs> homes that were made of wood and dirt all these years ago. Okay. Staying in the state park usually means campsites and rustic lodging. What state park offers plasma TVs, an internationally certified golf course, and an indoor water park? Honey Creek Resort, uh, Moravia, uh, Iowa. Um, it took more than 30 years of politics planning and prioritizing to get this project done. Um, here's what was written in a 1974 newspaper article. Iowa is not, Iowa is a tourism export state, the newspaper <laughs> article explained primarily because it does not have the facilities and attractions to either bring out-of-state travelers or keep Iowa's uh, residents in Iowa. But, you know, this is uh, something that would, would challenge that. In, places, in place are dozens of environmentally friendly practices, <coughs> geothermal, geothermal heating and cooling, a playground of recycled materials, preferential parking for hybrid vehicles, Iowa products on the restaurant's menus. Um, so, you know, even though I don't really like the idea that it has a water park, because I think that that tends to, you know, kind of um, do a number on, on, the, on resources, but, um, but I, I appreciate the spirit in which this project came, came together. Okay, here's a question for you. Where can you pay big bucks to get an oil enema? <laughs> the Raj, Fairfield, Iowa. It is uh, the Ayurvedic <coughs> system of health care is based upon 5,000 year old principles that originated in India. Transcendental med meditation is at the core of the business and uh, uh, of this vis business at the Raj, uh, which is really <coughs> destination spa that enhances mind-body connections, 
thorough cleansing of the head and the body. Um, many publications, New York Times, Los Angeles Times, spa magazines have provided positive reviews of this facility. Customers come from all continents. Um, Mike Love of the Beach Boys has been here. Donovan's been there. Filmmaker David Lynch. A one-week detox program cost about, well, this is when I last checked, too, uh, $4,750. But some stay longer. Or they spend $595 for what just one day of treatments, classes, and lectures. If you want an initial consultation, it's $150. Okay, what is the greenest city in Michigan? No, not Detroit. <laughs> Grand Rapids. <laughs> um, Grand Rapids has um, more lead certified buildings per capita than any place else, according to the U.S. Green Building Council. But, uh, and then there are tourism aspects to it, too. Uh, they have uh, uh, a, uh, an art museum that is uh, gold level lead status, Greenwell West rest Restaurant uh, earned a silver level of lead, 1,500 acre Millennium Park is being developed, LEED certification, um, and you know green, green fr friendly cabs that run on, um, I think vegetable oil, things like that. Still in Michigan, where can you buy Michigan in a jar? American Spoon. It's a local company that. Um, in its product line of preserves and, and uh, all kinds of items, uh, candies like you see in the middle there, the real uh, fruit intense candies. About 85% of the ingredients come from, come from Mi Michigan for the products. That includes Michigan sugar, which comes from sugar beets, Red Haven peaches, early glow strawberries, um, thimble berries, which I, did not, I was not familiar with um, a very delicate berry that tends to, um, you have to hand pick it. Um, people are hired to do that also and turn them into preserves, jellies, salsas. <coughs> they, hire, they hire 50 foragers to gather some of those wild berries. until the government shut down. Grand Canyon National Park would get an average of 16,000 visitors a day. What national park in Michigan gets that many in a year? Isle Royal. That's right, Isle Royal. What, what in Michigan. Um, but the average stay at Isle Royal is four days compared to six hours at the Grand Canyon. <laughs> To get to Isle Royal, you need to take a ferry ride. It's not open all year. When it gets cold, things um, shut down. Um, be, besides being known for having the national park, it, uh, the area is also known for having the longest <coughs> predator-prey research in the world, I believe. And the study is of wolves and, and, and moose. Isle Royal is a group of 400 some islands. The longest is 45 miles. Backpackers and kayakers can roam for days and not repeat their route. The world, and I mentioned the world's longest um, predator prey research. <coughs> Maybe, uh, well, I'll go through them real quick. Where can you learn to build a birch bark canoe, sail a 54 traditionally rigged schooner? or make sausage. North House Folk School, Grand Marais. Not that far from Ely, Minnesota. Beautiful drive up there. I can't emphasize that enough. If you have the time and uh, want to indulge, it's a great place. 
where can you ride the Flower Tower freight elevator and get a fantastic view of the Mississippi River? Mill City Museum in Minneapolis. Washburn Mill A, which became General Mills in 1928, uh, is a part of this, this museum. A fun and painless way to learn about water cons <coughs> conservation and ecology while playing miniature golf. The Putting Green in New Ulm, um, Minnesota. Uh, high school students did the research and writing for this nine hole course. A local physician decided the design and development uh, would be a great way for students to learn everything from business and art to math and physics concepts. Wisconsin is famous for beer. Our National Brewery Museum is in Petoskey. Only one major league baseball stadium has a light rail station. It is Target Field in Minneapolis. In what boutique hotel can you find an American flag made out of three dozen pairs of old blue jeans that are dyed and sewed together? <coughs> the Iron Horse Hotel in Milwaukee. It is a former uh, furniture warehouse built in 1907, could have just as easily turned into a, another condo or apartment project, except for one thing. Two weeks after the owner bought the building, Harley Davidson announced its um, museum would be constructed almost right next door. So this place is really, has really run with that. And here, what hotel began as a National Arbor Day Foundation retreat, that would be Lead Lodge, which makes environmental awareness and practices its uh, top priority. Wood chips from quickly growing poplar trees heat the building and the swimming pool. They power the central air system and the laundry equipment. Carpeting is made of recycled plastic bottles. Carpet padding comes from recycled tires. Light shades and sconces are recycled paper. And the views are just gorgeous. That's all I got. That's all I got, but uh, <coughs> I, I um, appreciate, the, um, I, again, the invitation to come today and um, your friendly faces as, as I was going through my song and dance here. And if you have questions, I'm very glad to answer them either now as we sit here or later on if, uh, if you prefer more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you. Any questions? It's in Wisconsin, on the Mississippi River, and um, not that far from, not that far from, uh, like a little bit north of Winona, Minnesota, if you were driving on that side. Yeah, I always have to look to make sure. It's between Red Wing, Minnesota, and Winona, Minnesota, but it is in Wisconsin. Those are the two, two most well-known cities. Just want to thank Mary again for coming to Wapaka today to talk about green travel. Appreciate it. And our volunteers for providing these beautiful desserts, and we'll hopefully see you next month. Thank you for coming to the Lunch and Learn.